Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our, uh, this week's MEI 101 lecture on prospects for a two-state solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Um, so this topic was suggested to me uh, in the light of recent statements uh, by um, President Trump and uh, his advisors, Jared Kushner, Jason Greenblatt, and David Freeman, Friedman, which uh, appeared to suggest that the United States might be abandoning uh, support for a two-state solution. The question is whether, uh, what, why this might be the case and whether a two-state solution um, is still a viable option. We, don't, we have not yet seen the so-called deal of the century, but we have seen the economic plan that was uh, launched at a meeting in Bahrain earlier this year, um, and which uh, did not mention uh, explicitly um, uh, the establishment of a Palestinian state. So it, it, it didn't say, it was you know, agnostic, if you like, on the issue of statehood, um, focused mostly on economic uh, aspects of a peace agreement. Uh, uh, if you're interested, I published a, uh, an article with uh, my colleague Teresa Cruz del Rosario, who's based at ARI at NUS for the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, in which we, we criticized uh, the lack of express reference to to statehood, and we also criticize the economic plans references to countries in this region, including Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, and Japan, saying that there was really no parallel. Uh, so long as sovereignty was not explicitly mentioned, you couldn't really look at these, these other um, examples. Okay, so in today's uh, talk, I'm gonna look at, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, this is a, uh, <laughs> The first slide, which is the title slide, and just for those of you who don't know who these individuals are, the gentleman on the left is Yitzhak, was Yitzhak Rabin, who was um, uh, a long-standing Israeli leader and, and uh, prime minister, and who was sadly assassinated two years after this photograph was taken. The gentleman in the middle, I'm sure you all know, is President Bill Clinton, and the man on the right was a kafir, uh, was Yasser Arafat, uh, who was the founder of the Palestine Liberation Organization. Um, he also uh, passed away. So the only person who's still alive from that photograph is, of course, uh, Clinton. Okay, so the issues that I'm going to cover in today's talk including, include you know, the two-state solution. What do we mean by two-state solution? Why, why is that uh, the main... Um, why does the international community insist upon two states, and why might this no longer be a viable uh, solution uh, today to resolve the, the long-standing disputes. I'll then look at the origins of this idea of partition. Where did this concept of two states come from? By looking at proposals to resolve the conflict during the British uh, colonial period. I'll then look at the relationship between Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinians during the Cold War, uh, when Jordan uh, uh, depending on your view, either annexed the West Bank or unified the West Bank with Jordan. And I'll look at also why that was the case, and then I'll, the relinquishment of uh, Jordanian sovereignty or Jordan's claim to that territory in 1988 and the emergence of the Palestine Liberation Organization. I'll then look at attempts to revive the two-state solution in the 1990s and the early uh, noughties before uh, concluding with uh, whether we have reached the end of the two-state solution. Um, so to address the first conceptual issue, why do we speak of two states rather than one state? This is a question for myself, but if you feel strongly and you want to answer it, you're most welcome. Why does the international community and those who favor two states argue in favor of that? For instance, why don't we have one state between the Mediterranean Sea and the River Jordan. Well, <laughs> one of the obvious reasons is uh, if you had one state, you would ha might be obliged to grant all the inhabitants uh, of that state citizenship. And it is uh, quite obvious to many that not all the inhabitants of their territories want either to live together or that you'd ever be able to have a functioning representative parliamentary democracy, if you like, 
when you have uh, communities that have quite different uh, aspirations. Um, for example, if Israel were to annex all of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip today, you, you'd face a situation where you'd have more Arabs than, than Jews, or, a very, or, or, or almost 50-50, uh, but probably more Arabs. Uh, in that case, it would be very difficult to have a, a parliamentary representative government. It could no longer be a Jewish state, which is the raison d'etre of um, political Zionism. Um, so that's one of the reasons why the international community has proposed to states to resolve the national aspirations of these two communities since, uh, since the 1930s. And this is also why uh, during the mandate period, um, the British, a British government commission of inquiry, uh, named after the chairman of the commission, Lord P Robert Peel, uh, suggested for the first time um, in this context, uh, partition as, as, as a solution to the conflict. Um, so just to give you some background, uh, the League of Nations, or the principal allied powers agreed to establish a mandate over uh, Palestine, um, what, was, what later became Transjordan in 1920, um, uh, which was subsequently approved by the League of Nations. And uh, in the mandate, it was declared that the British policies was to establish a Jewish national home. This, however, met opposition from the inhabitants who were majority Arab. And so for about two decades, you had this um, constant jostling uh, for power between the executive, which was British, the Jewish community, and the Palestinian Arabs who were resisting uh, this policy. And the Arabs were arguing as a majority at that, that time, they were more than 70%, uh, they should have political power, should be invested, vested in an executive or in a parliament, which you know, reflected the fact that they were the majority community. Um, at the time, the uh, British government did not agree to this, and various proposals were mooted to establish parity between the two communities, but the Palestinian Arabs always rejected them because they said, why should we settle for parity when we are the clear majority? Um, in 1936, was, uh, the British uh, High Commissioner, Arthur Walcott, uh, decided that the Arabs had a point. He said, you know, it's, it's, it's for 20 years, almost 20 years, there had been this policy of favoring um, what was seen as a minority community, um, and he thought, it, the, you know, the, the Arabs had a point, and he sent parliament, uh, proposals to the parliament in Westminster to accord some measure of representative government. So the idea that they would enfranchise about 150,000 people. Um, but to his surprise, Parliament rejected this proposal. They said if, we, if they had enfranchised the Arabs, the first thing they do would be to tinker with the constitutional scheme of the mandate and place restrictions on Jewish immigration to the territory. So they rejected the proposal. Um, in response, the Arab community or the leaders of the Arab community organized a strike, and then this led out into a mass rebellion against uh, the uh, British authorities there. It was a very serious rebellion, lasted almost three years. Um, thousands of people were incarcerated and, and killed. Um, and it was in this context that the uh, British government sent a royal commission of inquiry to investigate the causes of the disturbances. And this was in this context when they proposed partition as a solution to the, to the disputes. However, it'd be wrong to think that the only reason why they suggested partition was due to the violence. Certainly the violence was one of the factors where they thought the two communities could not live together. Not, not in the sense that they weren't on their day-to-day -day basis able to live together, but that by enfranchising, uh, uh, by establishing a um, at the point at which the British government would withdraw from Palestine, you would have a competition for political power. And in that context, he, they could not see both communities coming together to agree in one system of governments. Uh, the the, the, the uh, proposals in the Peel Commission were based on the idea that uh, there needed to be common thinking, a like-minded community for representative government to work. 
Of course, it was reflecting the colonial stereotypes of the time. The Appeal Commission said the Jews are mostly European, whereas the Arabs were primarily Asiatic in character. You know, they different languages, they, list, they, they read uh, different poets, they had different heroes, different holidays, um, different histories. Um, the, the, the elements that, could w that would allow parliamentary democracy to work were lacking. And that was the primary reason why they suggested a division of territory. Uh, at that time, they envisaged that a Jewish state would be established. It was the first time that they recognized the national rights of the Jews and the national rights of the Arabs. Um, just to give you uh, an inkling of a map. So this is a map of the Peel uh, Commission's recommendations. Uh, you can see that the area where they envisaged establishing a Jewish state was rather small. And this corresponded with the areas of Jewish settlement at that time in 1936. The area between Jerusalem and Jaffa would, be, would remain, remain under a British mandate, which would secure access to the Mediterranean, um, where you had important oil pipelines, and also the, the main holy places. The green area would be part of an Arab state. Now, this map is a bit incorrect, because actually the Peel Commission's map in 1936 included the Arab states, would also include Transjordan, so the whole thing would be one ar larger Arab state. Now, the um, Peel Commission's reports when it was published was quite controversial, and some people thought it went beyond its terms of reference because they hadn't anticipated that they would go as far as suggesting a solution to the conflict. It met with support, however, from the um, uh, Zionist uh, uh, organization, uh, especially from Ben-Gurion, because it, for the first time, enshrined the right to establish a Jewish state. Also, British officials also agreed with it because it would also place restrictions on Jewish immigration and bring an end to a long and sorry saga of British colonial rule in that part of the world. However, the, the Arabs didn't like the idea because they claimed, and, that they, and they were, even in the area of the Jewish state, they were still the majority um, of the population. They didn't see why they had to give up any, any territory uh, at all. But the moment is still important. And what happened is the Peel Commission's uh, recommendations were, were set aside um, initially. But the idea of two states didn't, didn't die and was implicit in the United Nations partition plan, um, which I can show you on, on this map. Um, and this, significantly, this plan differed from the Peel Commission's recommendations in several respects. One of the most important was the fact that it recognized the separate, uh, the for the first time, the separate identity of the Palestinian Arab people. So I mentioned before that the Peel Commission had recommended uniting uh, the so-called Arab parts of Palestine with uh, Transjordan. However, the United Nations partition plan recognized that, they, uh, that the Arab community of Palestine uh, were were separate and were entitled to establish a state of their own that would be distinguished from what was then called Transjordan. Um, again, Jerusalem would be uh, uh, established as what they call a corpus separatum, a separate body, which would, uh, for a period, initial period of 10 years, um, be administered by the, directly by the United Nations. Um, there are some unusual uh, features of the partition plan. Um, Jaffa would be like an Arab enclave, which is now Jaffa and Tel Aviv are now almost basically one city. Um, that was to be part of the Arab state, even though it was surrounded by uh, the, the proposed Jewish state. Um, and broadly, you can see that it, the, 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 uh, they thought to have territorial contiguity was, was, uh, was Transjordan. Um, and um, what would happen after the partition plan, uh, UN partition plan was uh, recommended, um, is that the UAE, the Security Council would establish a UN uh, mediator, Count Falk Bernadotte of Sweden. And uh, during the war, the partition plan um, largely fell away to the, to, to the sidelines. And the UN mediator proposed uh, a modification 
of that plan in the summer of 1948, in which he returned to the idea in the Peel Commission, which was to uh, link the, uh, the West Bank with, with Jordan um, again. What I should have explained earlier um, is that, uh, if you like, there, are, there were three parties to the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, the Zionist organization, uh, the Palestinian Arabs, and, and Transjordan. But there's always a, a difficult relationship between the Arabs of Palestine and, and Transjordan, because Transjordan was, was ruled by an emir, by a, by a king who originally came from, uh, from um, the Hejaz, uh, that is the Hashemite uh, royal family. And although their, their, their aims were often uh, the same, they weren't always uh, uh, linked. Um, so if you like, the Arabs of Palestine uh, later on wanted to establish uh, uh, you know, political organs that would be perhaps more democratic um, with political parties uh, rather than having a, a, it ruled by a king or, or a, a sheikh or royal family. So um, that's, that's important uh, to remember as we, as we think about these things, which is why we see the map of Palestine, proposed maps, if you like, for Palestine changing over the years. So I mentioned at the end of 1948, the UN mediator recommended the unification of the two banks of Jordan, and this is indeed what happened. So uh, from 1950, from 1948, but legally from 1950, when the act of unification was adopted by the Jordanian uh, parliament, there was a union of, uh, of the East Bank of Jordan and the West Bank. So this being the West Bank here, and the rest of, of Jordan. So this became part of the Kingdom of Jordan, and the Gaza Strip was administered but not annexed by, by Egypt. Um, and this was, this, this was the case up until 1967. Uh, however, Jordan, up until 1988, continued to claim sovereignty over the West Bank. And this led to difficult relationship between uh, King Hussein of Jordan and Yasser Arafat of the PLO as to who the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people uh, was. And that, that dispute was uh, resolved when the United Nations decided that the P Palestine Liberation Organization was the um, legitimate representative. So this brings me to my slide on what I call the fateful triangle. And that is the relationship between Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinians. And this is a pho photograph of, uh, of Yitzhak Rabin and uh, King Hussein of Jordan. Um, so the relationship between uh, the early Zionist pioneers or leaders and the uh, um, representatives of the Sharif of Mecca, who later became, uh, who later uh, formed states in, briefly in Syria and in Jordan and Iraq. Uh, it goes back to the early 20th century during um, secret negotiations between the British uh, Empire and uh, the leaders of the Arab, Arab revolt that sought to undermine the Turkish Empire from within. Uh, following the end of World War I, there were uh, uh, contacts between uh, leaders, of the, the, between Chaim Weissman, the leader of the Z English Zionists, and uh, the Sheriff of Mecca's son, Faisal, over reaching a modest vivendi between uh, the Arabs and the Jews. A lot of the, dis the difficulty was that the British government made all kinds of conflicting promises and statements during the course of the First World War. Um, uh, and when you look at the agreements and you place them side by side, it looks like Britain promised uh, Palestine, or what would become Palestine, known as Palestine, to the Arabs and the Jews. Um, Arabs by meaning to the Sharif of Mecca and the so-called Hussein McMahon correspondence. So the British government tried to resolve this dispute and they brought uh, Faisal and Weissman to London before they went to the Paris Peace Conference and the, an, an agreement was hashed out called the Faisal-Weissman Agreement in 1919, um, which has a long and checkered history. And it was a, if you like, it was the first time uh, the autonomy Oslo Accord, if you like, <laughs> the, the modern, the, uh, an older version of the Oslo Accords was, was proposed, although the agreement was not published until 19. 36. Um, so you had these contacts, if you like, uh, and these ideas about how to resolve the conflict, but no agreement was ever actually reached, and it was all kind of done behind uh, closed doors. Um, 
Also, in 19, uh, some Israeli historians uh, and Arabs, uh, Arab historians, claim that during the 1948 war, there were different. There was an un informal agreement between the uh, the leaders of the Yeshuv, the, the leaders of the Haganah, and the uh, leaders of the Arab Legion about dividing up uh, Palestine in 1948. So during the war. Um, go back to the partition plan, uh, there was, if you like, an untold agreement that Jordan would take the West Bank and the Israelis would uh, 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 take control of the areas that had been allotted to them in the UN partition plan. Um, and if you look at the actual fighting, that's more or less uh, what happened. The only area where there was heavy fighting because no agreement was reached was over, uh, primarily over Jerusalem. There was also a lot of fighting between uh, Egypt and the Negev, uh, between Egypt, uh, Israel and Egypt over um, the, the so-called Fallujah pocket, which is up here. Um, so you had these, and uh, also some Israeli historians would say that uh, if King Abdullah had not been assassinated in 1951, there would have been a peace treaty between Israel and Jordan uh, as early as early as 1951. As we know, uh, that never happened, and so uh, Israel's relations with Jordan were, if you like, conducted by the intelligence services for most of the Cold War period, and it was only after the PLO uh, had signed the so-called Secret Oslo Accords in 1993 that the Jordanians felt comfortable negotiating a peace treaty with uh, Israel, and it's important to emphasize that that peace treaty came after the first of the Oslo Accords, which was concluded in 1993. And equally as significant was that the Israel-Jordan peace treaty uh, made it clear that the boundary that was established between Israel and Jordan, which largely followed the Jordan uh, River, um, well, actually largely followed the, 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 the 1922 boundary between uh, Palestine and Transjordan was without prejudice to the status of any of the territories that came under Israeli uh, military uh, government control in 1967. So that would also include uh, East Jerusalem, which came under Israeli government control in 1967. Um, we should also say that from a Jordanian perspective, not only had its dispute, not only had the issue of who were the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people been resolved by then in favor of the PLO, but Jordan, uh, after relinquishing its claim in 1988, recognized a Palestinian state. So there was an embassy that was opened uh, in, in Ramallah. In addition, Jordan uh, also uh, said that the peace treaty did not apply to its custodianship of the Muslim holy shrines uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem. And until, this today, till, until today, the King of Jordan has a special role as the protector of the Muslim holy shrines, uh, primarily Al-Haram al-Sharif Temple Mount in, in Jerusalem, which the Palestinian Authority is, uh, or the State of Palestine has also recognized explicitly in a treaty that was concluded in 2013. So I mentioned that in 1993, there was the first Oslo Accord. So that was a picture I showed you at the beginning uh, with Arafat, Bill Clinton, and Yitzhak Rabin. Um, and then after that, there was the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty. And then in 1995, there was the second or so-called uh, Oslo II. Um, and in that year, uh, this is a picture again showing uh, Yasser Arafat on your left. Shimon Peres in the middle, and to your right, Yitzhak Rabin, when they were given the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for, for those negotiations. Um, and so in 1995, you had, this, if you like, the more important agreement, the agreement that put, provided flesh on the bones of the 1993 uh, treaty that was, as I mentioned, was largely conducted in secret, to the extent that even some of the Israeli negotiators involved in the peace treaty with Jordan were not even aware of its, uh, had not been aware of its uh, existence. Um, also, I should mention this. What's significant is that the two Israeli politicians who are now, well, actually, they're all passed away now, but the two Israeli politicians uh, here were from the Labour Party. Um, and I'm emphasizing that because since, two, since 2000, we've had uh, more or less, we've had uh, the Likud Party has been in power, the Likud and Kadima 
uh, which are right-wing parties and um, are opposed to relinquishing any territory in the West Bank. So at the time, you had the Labour Party, which was uh, seen to be uh, more pragmatic. And uh, one of the results was the, uh, uh, the uh, signing of the Oslo Accords, which allowed the Palestine Liberation Organization to return to uh, those areas of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip that were relinquished by the Israeli uh, military. So you saw uh, PLO leaders returning to the Gaza Strip and to uh, the major uh, towns and villages in the West Bank. So this shows you um, uh, the impact of the second Oslo II, the 1995 agreement, um, which subdivided the Palestinian areas that is the populated areas into different zones, areas A, B, and C. Uh, areas A, uh, which is the darkest uh, yellow color, orange color on your screen, uh, was where the Palestinian a Palestinian authority was established that had full control over these areas. Areas B was um, partial Palestinian control, um, or, or where the Israelis could also um, intervene when needed, and area C, which remained under full Israeli control. Uh, Note that the area that remained under full Israeli control amounted to 61% of the West Bank, so the majority of the West Bank is under full Israeli military control, even at the height of the um, Oslo Accords. Now, of course, the Palestinians weren't stupid. <laughs> they, they entered into the agreement uh, under the impression or uh, with the view that this was only an interim agreement uh, and that the permanent status issues were to resolve the uh, disputes, and their aim was to establish two states, uh, a Palestinian state. So they envisaged, and it was in the agreement, that uh, the Oslo Accords were interim, and that after a five-year period, there was an expectation that the two sides would sit down and reach an agreement on the rest of the permanent status issues, Jerusalem refugee settlement, security borders, water, etc. Um, some of these issues, uh, like compensation, yeah, and the compensation was also one of them, um, although there are different interpretations of that. Compensation for the properties um, that were confiscated by Israel in 1948, 1967. So that was, that was the aim of the agreement. At that time, no one envisaged that the Oslo Accords, the interim phase, would, if you like, uh, be perpetual. It would become a perpetual <laughs> agreement rather than uh, an interim agreement, and that there would be no more phased withdrawals they would come to an end in 2000. And this is when we had the uh, second uh, Palestinian uh, intifada and um, a few more attempts to res uh, following more failed negotiations, the actual situation on the ground uh, has not changed. One thing I want to highlight um, is this area here, this big square here. This is known as the uh, Jordan Valley. So just, just bear this in mind. I'll come back to it uh, later, towards the end of the talk. Um, mention should also be mentioned, in, in addition to these areas, um, there are also the issue of Israeli settlements, um, which have been a perennial source of uh, dispute between Israel and the Palestinians. Um, under international law, the, 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 the West Bank the East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip, that is the territories that came under Israeli military control in 1967 are con considered occupied territories. And so a specific legal regime applies to those territories and it makes it clear that you can't, uh, one, of the, one of the many issues you cannot do when you're in occupying power, settle your own population into the territory you control. This is under Article 49.6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention and Israel was aware of this, and Israel was advised by its lawyers in 1967 that this was the, the, the state of the law and that should Israel press ahead with a settlement policy, which it subsequently did, it would face uh, opposition from the international community, which subsequently happened. Sometimes it's claimed, you know, there's nothing wrong with settling people in, in homes and houses, but as you know, in any, in any dispute, it's a big issue because it, it affects uh, the demographics of the territory. It can also affect the territorial contiguity of the territory because settlements aren't simply prefab homes. They become towns, villages. Some of them are almost as large as cities. They have their own road network, their own electricity network, their own water network. Some roads are open to everyone, some roads are only open to 
the settlers. And the, so this map will show you where the settlements, where the big settlements have been established. And you can also see that they've been established in strategic uh, areas in an attempt, if you like, to blur the 1967 green line to make it appear as if it's not really there. So if you go to Israel today and you go into the West Bank, you wouldn't even notice that you've left Israel to go for the West Bank. Unless you had a GPS and you had, you know, had the coordinates, you wouldn't notice. There's, no, there's nothing that tells you you're, you're moving from one area to, to the next. Um, if you look at the blue areas, the vast bulk of them are around Jerusalem, and the Palestinians claim that eventually this will block uh, their ability to access, to have territorial contiguity, I should say, between a future Palestinian or an independent Palestinian state and Israel. They've also been established near large uh, water aquifers and uh, uh, around here. And you can also see there's a string of settlements in what's called the Jordan Valley. And in 2002, uh, during the second Palestinian Intifada, Israel began building a large concrete and wire barrier, um, which is shown here in black, and the red, red areas are where it's still being constructed. The Palestinians are challenged the legality of this move uh, uh, at the International Court of Justice, and in, in, in a nutshell, the International Court of Justice agreed with the Palestinians and said that the wall was contrary, not because building a wall is illegal or protecting yourself from armed groups is illegal, but because they said it's a land, effectively a land grab, because the wall goes around all the major settlements uh, which are contrary to international law and, in, and also is a form of de facto annexation because it prejudices the uh, ability to establish a Palestinian state. Also under international law, Israel's required to withdraw from the occupied territories this shows that it's not prepared to withdraw from all of the occupied territories, but that it plans to retain or annex uh, large chunks. In 2002, the Palestinians also claimed at the ICJ, 2003, that uh, Israel had plans to build another wall over here, um, but that never happened. However, it's not completely uh, irrelevant, as we shall see. Um, I mentioned uh, the so-called roads, so these are the main Main, the main roads, and then there are some roads. Some of these roads are not, um, cannot be used by Palestinians. So if you go to the West Bank, you'll see different number plates are used. So if you're an Israeli, you'll have, um, uh, I can't even remember now, I think a black, uh, a normal number plate. If you're Palestinian, it will be green. Um, so you're very easily identified. Um, and some of the roads, uh, you, uh, Palestinians will need a permit. To, some of them are mixed. And the Palestinian cars that go on them have a permit from the military authorities. They're allowed to drive on them. Some of them they can't, they can't drive on. There are also movement restrictions. Uh, there were a lot more during the, uh, uh, as you can imagine, during the Intifada and uh, in the years after. Some of these have been uh, removed since then, but they, they still largely uh, remain, especially in the areas around uh, the wall or the barrier. This gives you an indication of, from a Palestinian perspective, what is left uh, uh, for their independent state. So it's approximately just over 50%. And again, I just want to highlight Jordan Valley area is one of the largest chunks here. So this area is significant because it doesn't fall under the areas A and B of the Palestinian Authority. It's sparsely uh, populated. So this is Jericho, uh, and there are Israeli settlements. So I have to check, but there in fact might be more or an equal number of Israeli settlers here as there are Palestinians. Okay, in the night, uh, so after I've shown you uh, that diagram, it might be unsurprising uh, <laughs> for you to be aware that uh, there was a lot of criticism of the Oslo Accords. There was criticism of the Oslo Accords actually from the beginning, with uh, Palestinian intellectual Edward Said referring to them as the Palestinian, the equivalent of the Palestinian Versailles uh, Treaty. Um, uh, you should also be aware that uh, a similar proposal to Oslo had been proposed by the, uh, in the Camp David Accords with Egypt in 1980. Um, uh, but was rejected by the PLO. I should say that the original um, Camp David 
autonomy proposal um, envisaged no role for the Palestine Liberation Organization, only for the Palestinian inhabitants and Jordanian uh, representatives. So that's one reason why you can imagine the PLO weren't willing to accept it back then. Uh, but effectively, after the end of the Cold War, they accepted something that was very similar to autonomy, hence the criticism from the Palestinian side. Well, why did you reject this when it's exactly a rehash of what you could have accepted earlier, when it would have been easier to have rolled back Israeli settlements when they were still in their infancy? Another criticism was that the Oslo, the, uh, Oslo Accords did not explicitly mention settlements. They were a final status issue. However, it's been argued that settlements were already in violation of international law. You didn't need to have that in an agreement. Um, again, but a more, a more concrete issue, and I've given the dates of the, these two books, Virginia Tilly, an American political scientist, and Ali Abu Nima, a Palestinian, Jordanian um, uh, journalist, writer, blogger, whose father was formerly uh, one of Jordan's uh, ambassadors to the United Nations. They came out with some trenchant criticisms of the Oslo Accords uh, about 10, 15 years ago, in which um, largely argued that it was no longer possible to have two states. And in a nutshell, the main argument was the settlements. The, the settlements were, were so huge that you know, today you have over 600,000 settlers I think when Virginia Tilly wrote her first article in the London Review of Books in 2003, there were only 250,000. And she was arguing then that it was unvi you know, unrealistic. So you can imagine it's only fortified her argument since then. And her point was settlements were not just you know, where people were living, there was a whole infrastructure, a whole legal regime, a whole system, and that it was not possible for any Israeli government to uh, either dismantle them or remove them. Although some people refer to the situation in Algeria in 1950s, when the French government did remove, remove a million people from, from Algeria. Um, but there, one could imagine that the, the Israeli government, any Israeli government that proposed that today would face a whole host of, of problems, um, which is why it has not been seriously mooted. Although there were, during the Oslo Accords, there, there were um, physical removals of, of some of the settlements that had been established, so-called outposts. Um, in the uh, mid-1990s, and Ariel Sharon did dismantle all of the settlements that had been established in the Gaza Strip in 2005, which was about 13,000 people. But again, 13,000 people, 600,000 people, there's a big di bigger difference. And of course, we should mention that from a Palestinian perspective, East Jerusalem is also occupied territory. So they also consider all the settlements uh, established, around the, uh, established in East Jerusalem around the old city um, as settlements, and no Israeli government is uh, either from the right or the left is prepared not only to withdraw settlements but to relinquish control or relinquish sovereignty over over Jerusalem. So these were some of the criticisms that that were articulated, uh, and their solution, surprise, surprise, was a a one-state solution. Um, Again, the one-state solution is not a new idea. That was the PLO's position in the 1960s. And there's a reason why the PLO and those who support them want a one-state solution, because the assumption is uh, in a one-state solution, you'd have majority rule, and you'd, essentially you'd be putting all the power into the hands of the Palestinians. And for that reason, the Israelis, it's unacceptable uh, to the um, Israeli governments. And so this, in turn, has provoked a, 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 a counter-critique from the Israeli left, or the Democrats, if you like, uh, who have come out and have said, but Israel uh, effectively is one state, it treats it as one state, and uh, um, unless it withdraws from most of the territories, it, it will increasingly face criticism that it is, it is a, 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 a tantamount, when you look at the whole territory, including the occupied territories under Israeli control, to uh, apartheid. So, um, as I mentioned, since 2000, you've had a series of right-wing governments in Israel. Uh, after Netanyahu, a few years after Netanyahu was elected, had quite a dramatic ideological shift to the right. Not saying Ariel Sharon wasn't uh, right-wing either, but uh, what ha what we have seen um, since 2012 is a more concerted argument to justify. Uh, some of Israel's more, more extreme policies, including the settlements. So one of, one of the 
In 2012, a commission uh, was established uh, to look into the legality of unauthorized Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And this committee consisted of people who largely favored uh, the Israeli uh, government's view, Edmund Levy, Alan Baker, and others, who were already on the record for having, you know, for, for seeing it, you know, supporting, if you like, the Greater Israel Project, for want of a better word. And they, surprise, surprise, said, you know, uh, it was perfectly lawful for Israel. The, these these so-called outposts uh, were lawful. And they came up with uh, intriguing arguments, including that the occupied territories were not, in fact, occupied, and that domestic law trumped over international law, and they had this curious argument that Jordan had relinquished sovereignty in 1988, and therefore Israel's claim was superior to the Palestinians' claim, etc., etc. Anyway, long and short of the story is that they were uh, providing illegal rationale for settlements. Uh, in 2012, the government, uh, there was a huge outcry. Uh, international community, Palestinians, NGOs, all criticized it. So the government said, we're not going to implement the report. That's what they said in 2012. However, since then, uh, it could be argued that the report is surreptitiously being implemented. So in 2017, it's settlement regular, regularization law that retroactively approved uh, the legalization of uh, a couple of thousand homes in settlements and outposts on private Palestinian land because initially uh, the settlements began as military outposts, Nahal settlements, then public land was expropriated and now we've got to the point where private Palestinian land is expropriated where they can identify a Palestinian owner, they are paid 125% compensation um, but still the land is being taken. Uh, there was a challenge to the legality of this law by uh, an Arab-Israeli NGO called Adallah, and um, during the challenge, the uh, Attorney General of Israel refused to defend the law, said it was unconstitutional. So what the Israeli government did is they hired a private law firm to represent them, and this private law firm apparently uh, claimed that all the land was part of Israel and that Israelis could live anywhere they liked in the West Bank. I think it's quite a big shift uh, if this is true because uh, this claim had never been made so openly and brazenly uh, until now. Um, the document is in Hebrew. It's not been translated to my knowledge, but that might be changing. In addition, in 2018, we had the nation state law. Um, I wrote a, a short article in the Straits Times, um, which, which you have the copies outside if you're interested in, in reading it. This law also provoked a lot of criticism in Israel and globally, including uh, in the United States. Um, the, uh, it's the basic law, so a constitution, constitutional law. It um, describes self-determination as being exclusive to the Jewish people. It speaks of the land of Israel without defining what the land of Israel is which means that people could interpret that as including the, the West Bank. Um, and um, it enshrined uh, Jewish settlement as a national value. Again, it's ambiguous. What do they mean by Jewish settlement? Is it just Jewish settlements within the 1967 lines, or does it include the land of Israel? So this is uh, very controversial, and it's still being debated, and there are still attempts uh, to repeal the law, but it's currently on the statute book. Then most recently, and this is my last slide, uh, we had, you know, we've had two uh, elections in Israel this year, um, and during the campaign for the last election, the second of the, the, the campaigns, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu openly said that he was contemplating uh, the possible annexation of the Jordan Valley this is a map again he showed you. And if you recall the map that I showed you earlier, you know where I'm referring to. So this is Jericho, and this is the Jordan Valley. And one of the reasons why annexation of this area uh, is, is attractive in many ways to, from an Israeli perspective, or right-wing perspective, or the Likud perspective, um, is that there are very few Palestinians living there. So if you annex territory, you have to op offer this the inhabitants' citizenship, if they're all Palestinians, it kind of defeats the objective of maintaining 
uh, the Jewish character of the state. If there are very few Palestinians, then it doesn't make... You get the land and the people, but it doesn't really matter because they're not going to affect the demography of the states. But again, one can imagine that any further efforts to erode a two-state solution will be characterized um, as apartheid. So this is the situation today. Uh, we have a, a, a US government that has not been very critical of uh, some of these um, efforts. Uh, we have yet to see the deal of the century. Um, some people have suggested, but again, it's all speculation, right? But they've suggested that there might be uh, uh, contained in that uh, uh, deal of the century something less than a, than a Palestinian state. And the question is, if, if the two-state solution is no longer viable, what comes next? And I'll leave that question open to you because I uh, would like to hear your thoughts on that. And thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions you might have now or after the talk if you can raise your hands and identify yourself. That would be appreciated. What is so significant about Jericho? That's the first question. Second one is, if you build a wall around the West Bank, how can you have settlement inside the Israel's settlement inside the West Bank when you have a wall already over it? Sorry, your second question is? When you build a wall yeah. around the West Bank, yeah. but you still have settlement inside the yeah, West yeah, Bank. Yeah. What's so the point? How, how do they do the administrations? Administration of the settlements. Yes. In what sense do you mean? Like because you have the West Bank. Yeah. You have the wall. Yeah. All over your West Bank. But inside the West Bank, yeah, yeah. you still have is okay. your settlement. Okay. I think I'll, I'll answer your second question if I understand it. So the wall uh, is fairly porous. So the, the so the okay. First of all, it's a wall only in uh, heavily populated areas like Jerusalem, Calcilia. Uh, when it goes into um, areas between major cities, it takes the role of more like an electrified fence. And it's porous in the sense that you have checkpoints. So it's easy for, if you've got the right car, the right papers, the right number plate, you can just go through them. But if you're a Palestinian, it's not so easy. Um, however, this does imply that perhaps some people, figures in Israel, would be willing to relinquish those settlements that are outside the wall, if you like. They're not as important as those inside the wall, perhaps. But, uh. And your second question, Jericho. I don't think the significance so much as Jericho. Jericho is, a, is a, a major Palestinian town, and the Israeli government has no intention or interest to annex it. It's the area around it. So I mentioned it's vastly populated. It's the front, long, uh, an important frontier zone was Jordan. It's also, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's the water, uh, Jordan River, and there's also a lot of farming uh, agriculture uh, in that area. Um, in fact, under the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty, Israel leased lands from Jordan for 25 years, and that was terminated, actually, a few months ago by the Jordanian government, they in the sense that they didn't renew the lease. So that's the import, one of the reasons why, why the... Uh, Jordan Valley is, is, is important. Security, uh, economy, um, contiguity, all these things. John. I, yep. yep. I think, I think the, why, why that's, sorry, why, why does that, uh, it was marked out like this, was that when the uh, Oslo Agreement was in negotiation, Arafat was afraid of being accused of giving up on the West Bank and that he would end up with a state that was only in the Gaza Strip. And so he needed something that was uh, symbolic of his intention to recover the West Bank. And so what was, what was agreed was that they would have sovereignty, that we'd have control over Jericho. So you've got the city of Jericho and you've got, a, I think, a village to the north of it, and that's about it. So, so all, that, all the uh, arrangements for Palestinian-controlled areas 
began with Jericho. If you'd looked at the map in 1993, end of 93, beginning of 94, you'd have seen only the Jericho area marked out as being under mm -hmm. a Palestinian Authority yeah. control. So that's the origin of that. Mm -hmm. If they'd begun in some other fashion and maybe said, let's put Nablus under Palestinian Authority control, maybe, maybe Jericho would still be be marked as being a white territory under Israeli control. But it is, it's true, it's a major town, Palestinian town. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah, so you, between 93 and 95, you had something called the Gaza Jericho Agreement, which is exactly what how John, John described. Um, and in fact, uh, that's, uh, Jericho is where the, uh, the Secretary General of the PLO, Saib Erekat, uh, lives. Um, yeah, and they used to have a, uh, a casino there famous casino which they uh, had to close in 2000 during the intifada and hasn't been uh, reopened um, but it was a it was a large source of money for the the Palestinian Authority because uh, many Israelis would also go because you can't gamble in Israel so that they'd, they'd actually go to 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 Jericho to to gamble along with Palestinians but the, those days are long gone Thank you. So when I saw the title of this, uh, it reminded me of um, one of the similar discussions which I attended, I think, in Israel last year. So there was an Israeli speaker, there was an, a Palestinian speaker as well, and, and both of them were quite established. And I think they found consensus in that, that there would not be a one-state solution, there would not be a two-state solution <laughs> in their lifetime, yeah. even for the next 50 and 100 years. Yeah. I think they are much more or less optimistic about this. But what are your thoughts on that, on that pessimism? Oh, no, I, I mean, I'm also equally uh, pessimistic. But uh, whether it can last, the situation can last for 100 years, I, 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 I doubt it. <laughs> because no one's happy. Uh, I, think, I think the Palestinians haven't revolted because I think partly for, for various reasons. One of them is they looked everywhere else. There's been violence, Syria, Egypt, and it's been a mess. And that's... One of the reasons why they haven't uh, haven't done anything, um, but the situation. I mean, everyone says it's unsustainable, and yet, as you know, it, it continue, keeps going on and on. But um, I think things will come to a head at some point because, you know, you know the, the the leadership at the moment is very in the Palestinian side is very old, mm, and there'll be uh, there will be a transition, and we don't know if the the people who will transition into positions of power will have the same outlook as the current leadership. The situation in the Gaza Strip is very precarious. Um, I can't see that rumbling on and on forever. I mean, if you believe the UN, uh, you know, there won't be potable water in the foreseeable uh, future. And you've seen the current political states uh, in Israel. It's uh, completely divided. So, um, so things seem to be, uh, seem to be more fractured uh, than ever. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I agree that at the moment neither of these solutions appears likely, but it's a big question mark is what, is what, what might happen after. And I don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Eric I'm from NUS Law. So <clears throat> um, now, all this discussion, quite interesting, but this brings me back to 1945 when the UN was founded. Mm. We had six principal organs, the General Assembly, Security Council, the ICJ, the Secretariat, ECOSOP, and the Trusteeship Council, of which the last one has been put in, suspended since there are no trust territories anymore. Now, you mentioned Jordan having some role in terms of religion, <laughs> as well as in terms of being part of negotiations up until at least Oslo. Mm. But at some point, you see Jordan dropped out of the it seems that Jordan has dropped out of it. And now what you have is an unequal negotiation between a sovereign state and a state which may or may not be sovereign depending on how you fit Palestine within the Montevideo Convention rules. And then you have Gaza, which is something that people usually don't talk about, but it's actually the place where the worst atrocities are happening. So there have been discussions of a three-state solution in which Jordan and Egypt return to the picture in terms of them being trustees of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, respectively. What do you think this is 
a way to break this deadlock or do you think that it's just going to worsen the situation? I don't think either Egypt or Jordan will step in to do what Israel has failed to do. And they will tell the Israelis very clearly that your obligation under international law is to withdraw from the territories and they're not going to help them with that. No, no. How would they pressure Israel by coming back? It's under Israeli military control. Uh, they haven't allowed the Palestinian Authority to exercise uh, more powers. Um, there's been no movement in that regard. Uh, there is something called self-determination in international law. And the Palestinian people do not desire to be part of Egypt or Jordan. And that's been enshrined, also recognized by the Israeli government. Um, and by the Jordanians. Um, and that uh, for Jordan to go in again would, would also pose lots of problems for the Jordanian uh, government, uh, which has its own issues as well. So I don't see them coming in at all. I think maybe some Israelis would like <laughs> them to come in, but they're not, they're not going to. Thank you. Uh, Paul Freeland, I'm a grad student at the LKY school. Um, a couple times uh, you mentioned the, the so-called deal of the century, uh -huh. uh, which went about as well as most things that come out of the current U.S. administration. Um, I, know that, I know this bunch, their foreign policy is fairly mercurial, mm -hmm. to put it lightly. Yeah. Um, but one of the, even like the, like the front runners on the Democratic side, uh, even then that you're seeing like there's, there's uh, pr less interest in U.S. adventurism and entanglements abroad in other countries. Um, so what I'm wondering is if the U.S. continues this more inward facing uh, uh, trend that's, that's happening right now, is one, is there someone else who could step in and then, and play the role that the U.S. did, like in the Oslo Accords and trying to broker a solution? Or alternatively, is the U.S., if the U.S. is to be less involved in this conflict, might that be a productive thing because it, it would put Israel and Palestine on a more equal footing versus Israel always having the 800-pound gorilla in the room in its corner? Thanks for that question. Um, well, I don't think the U.S. is, <laughs> is withdrawing its support for Israel. It, it's withdrawn from the Kurdish areas. It's, it's upset some of the Gulf allies. It's been an unreliable partner, but I've not seen anything but unswavering support for the current Israeli government, and the current Israeli government is well, well, well equipped to deal with any threats that they see in their, in their neighborhood, regardless of whether the U.S. Uh, uh, supports them. Was that with, with regard to other actors coming in? I don't see anyone. I mean, obviously, the Russians are there on the ground. Some people think the Chinese might play a bigger role. I don't see it, personally. Um, we should also not forget that the Americans is not just military power, it's soft power. The US, well, until Trump came along, uh, was funding a lot of the uh, aid packages in the region, also for the refugees, UN UNRWA, in, in Palestine. Also, they were one of the largest donors to the Palestinian Authority. Um, they've withdrawn that money. I doesn't look like it's been uh, uh, I mean, that, that the money has been, um, uh, that the Europeans have stepped in. I mean, the Europeans could step in financially. Whether they want to play a larger uh, a military role, I, I, I doubt. Um, so, again, I, I, at the moment, I, I don't see, uh, I don't see, I mean, uh, U.S. withdrawal, U.S. Uh, willing to intervene. It might prevent some adventurism by some states, it might encourage some states to take back. Israel has an unsolved plan to get closer in order to resolve their security issues. But in terms of the conflict, I don't see see any the current U.S. government changing its policy um, towards Israel, at least uh, not yet. By which I mean complete support for Israel. But um, I would like to hear if any, anyone else has other views <laughs> on that. Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, do you think uh, if uh, the coming uh, U.S. elections uh, is like going to have a different result, and if like Trump is going to leave the office, and there is a Democratic, I mean, uh, of course, it's just a uh, just a protection. Uh, do you think if a Democratic candidate wins the election, it's going to affect uh, the Middle East policy, for example, uh, like for the prospects uh, for a two-state solution to the uh, this conflict? And uh, will I mean? Uh, Regardless of the U.S. itself, even though, uh, would there be any other factors like from both uh, Palestine and Israel? Will they be happy to accept if there is a democratic candidate that's like going to turn back to the negotiating table and like be the brokers? Um, I think it depends which democratic candidate wins. Um, some are more critical of 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 current policies than others, such as uh, uh, Bernie Sanders. Um, so, so it would, it would depend uh, which candidate would win. There's certainly in the House, uh, 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 some members are have a very different, have come out and supported, as you know, BDS and others. Um, again, unless it was a huge swing to the de Democrats and you had a, a, one of these leaders, uh, Sanders winning, or maybe Biden as well could be better. He was very critical of the settlements when he was the deputy. Uh, if they could take both houses, maybe you'd see a shift, but this is a big if. Whether that would be make any difference in Israel, again, it depends which government is in power in Israel. Uh, with Netanyahu, I don't think it would make any difference. Um, we haven't seen Kahol Levan tested, but but yeah, I mean, if you had a, a strong democratic uh, government in the U.S. and it's one of those figures who's more critical on Israel, and you had a different. The gentleman in the back was the hat. A uh, question of uh, fantasy, perhaps, if you forgive me. Uh, was there some point uh, in the past where there was a solution that was, or at least close to a solution being found? Um, <laughs> good question. Well, some people suggest that in the early days of the Second Palestinian Inter... Well, okay. Have there been, been there have been basically moments in the past that different I mentioned that there could have been a peace treaty with Israel and Jordan before the assassination of King Abdullah in nineteen fifty one. Um, there could have been perhaps uh, an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians and Jordan during the autonomy negotiations had the PLO been included in nineteen eighty, had they not been sidelined. That's another missed moment there. Um, we don't know if, if uh, Rabin had not been assassinated in 1995, would he have gone further? Big question mark, we don't know. Uh, after the failure of the Camp David talks in 2000, there were further negotiations in Taba in 2001. Had the Intifada been brought to a close then, could that have resulted in agreement? Again, we don't know. <laughs> Another moment may have been Napolis in 2007 to 2008, where the two sides came very close to an agreement, but then Prime Minister Ehud Olmert was indicted and imprisoned, arrested and imprisoned on corruption charges, so his government fell, and then uh, Netanyahu was elected. Um, there have been suggestions that they came, the two sides came very close uh, to an agreement then. So there have been, there have been different moments uh, in the past, but for some reason or other, you know, someone was shot, <laughs> or, or it just, uh, you know, it, the magic wasn't, wasn't there. Uh, John, yeah, so you another question. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's a comment, really. I think um, if, the, if the United States did step back, um, the, then the question would be, would that restore... Um, any impetus to attempt to find solutions on the basis of international law, which of course is something which which Israel's resisted all along, uh, but but the United Na uh, United Nations involvement, uh, or even the European Union uh, getting uh, involved more actively, it would be on that basis. Yeah, I don't. Uh, and and yeah. but it's interesting that you know, for, for, for example, Israel's uh, got now developed um, warmer relations with Russia and China. And China's a big trading partner now. Um, 
Russia and uh, Israel conferred over the Syrian conflict. Um, so there's so there's that. So this is going on, but those countries are officially committed to um, the the uh, a solution based on UN resolutions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's this there's this kind of odd juxtaposition of the of the actual uh, of the theoretical position of the states and what they're actually doing, which actually doesn't move constructively towards any yeah. kind of solution. Yeah. So I think that's the, that's one of the challenges. Yeah. Um, the um, when you look around for alternatives in terms of international diplomacy at the moment, there's nothing very promising looking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, I agree with you. I don't, I don't know if, 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 if it'll make any difference to the U.S. approaches to international law. They, they, they're still, um, if you know, the Palestinians have brought this case at the ICJ against the U.S. The U.S. is not even, to my knowledge, bothering to turn up. <laughs> So the, the, has, the withdrawal of the U.S. troops from various parts of the Middle East doesn't appear to have made any change at all to their, their larger view on... In fact, they've gone further, as you know, they've gone further further to the right in, in the sense that they are actually... I mean, the Israeli ambassador to... Sorry, the American ambassador to Israel is... is you know, so f off the right. I mean, he was, in, he was under a tunnel. If you, There was a video, a photograph of him knocking... Uh, uh, a tunnel through one of the settlements in the in the old city. Uh, you know, it's never <laughs> usually American ambassadors stay away, and you know this, the position was consistently all U.S. administrations until Trump's settlements are contrary to international law; they're an obstacle to the two-state uh, solution. Um, Jerusalem must be a shared capital, um, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The long-term vision is of two states. All that's gone. So. So it seems you have a U.S. administration that's taken taken dramatic sides, not just pro-Israel, pro Likud Israel, or even further to the religious right. And we've had the whole the whole issue of evangelical support for Trump is also playing out, uh, and they're withdrawing from unpopular wars where there perhaps there are not so many U.S. interests. But again, China, Russia coming in. Yes, it's true. Verbally, they support two states. Um, but are they willing to go beyond that? What could they? Are, are they even? They're not even major donors to the Palestinian Authority. None of these countries, neither China nor the Russians, have come in with billions. I mean, the Americans were giving, I think, two hundred million dollars a year to UNRWA. Uh, what, what's the Russian contribution? The Chinese is nothing. It's peanuts. So you know, words are meaningless. <laughs> it's cheap. Word, rhetoric is cheap. Support for two states is, is, is nothing when, when you look at what they actually do on the ground. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. I have uh, t two questions. One is, uh, what is the significance of Netanyahu's uh, uh, annexation plan for the Jordan Valley? Why does he announce it now? What does it, uh, what does it mean? And the other question is, uh, obviously, um, the one-state solution, the uh, Jewish nature of the state stands against it. So that's mm -hmm. not going to work, um, at least for, uh, now. Uh, and the two-state solution, is it still possible with all these annexation and non-contiguous, like, Palestinian lands? And why would, um, and also, of course, of the policy of uh, the current Israeli government that doesn't uh, support it. And, and, and for, for uh, Israel, it doesn't really add much. I mean, probably the, uh, the deal of the century, as they uh, uh, as they call it, it's just going to be Israel with some local administration for Palestinian, uh, but Israel controlling um, the whole the whole region or the whole uh, uh, territory. Um, what what do you say about that? I mean, we don't have a one-state solution, and then we there is no uh, possibility. There is no possibility for a two-state solution. So basically, some people are just saying this is going to be the fact on the ground. Uh, that is Israel controlling the land uh, with giving the Palestinians just some semblance of um, self-rule, if you like. Hmm. Just to address your last point, that's effectively what the case has been for the last 30 years. So nothing has changed. But with regard to your first two questions, um, 
Why annexation now? I think uh, Netanyahu uh, was facing uh, that second election, um, and uh, he was appealing to his base. He knows that they're, you know, part of the coalition. His coalition includes, you know, the religious right-wing parties that uh, that are strong supporters of the settlements. Uh, he he's not naive enough that he's going to annex all the the West Bank because he knows the consequences would be what the consequences would be. So the only realistic is to annex either the large Gush, uh, the, the, the settlements around Jerusalem, or, or, the, or an easier one would be um, uh, 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 the Jordan Valley because of the demographics and the importance. And although, of course, he also knows that would be dramatic uh, and would entail you know, the possible end of the two-state solution. He did, however, I have to say, when I watched the video, he did condition his uh, support for annexation quite uh, he qualified it quite heavily, saying, only if my advisors say it's the right time and my military advises me that it would be do wise to do this, etc. So he didn't say, I'm going to go ahead. He kind of like said, he was considering it and, you know, did his dramatic thing uh, with his um, map and stick. Um, the second question, is a two-state solution possible with annexation? Well, no, not, not if he's going to annex the Jordan Valley, uh, um, which would clearly would be, you know, because it would separate... Uh, well, not, it wouldn't be a two-state solution any Palestinian would want, uh, because it wouldn't have control over, over its uh, trade with, 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 um, with uh, Jordan. Um, although, you know, this, it almost reflects, again, what has been on the reality uh, since Oslo, in the sense that this is, this is what it's like anyway. I mean, it, the formal act would make it uh, harder to, to deny, but the de facto that it is under Israeli, the whole area is under Israeli control. Area C is under Israel's control. Even areas A and B are under Israel's over, overall security control. You still have the civil administration, if you like, it sits at the top, and then you've got the PA, and then you've got all those other institutions under it. Um, the only area that is probably uh, it's still also under Israeli control, but it's more free is paradoxically uh, the Gaza Strip. Um, so again, yeah, it's just a, that's the situation, and I, I don't see, uh, um, I mean, absent any severe or severe or any pressure on Israel to 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 uh, to change its policies, I don't see I don't see any change. Uh, I don't see any appetite for that either. Um, so it's just going to keep getting worse. Um, whether they'll have the village leagues or Palestinian, there'll be Palestinians willing to run these areas without an authority. I don't know. I think that I think that would be. I think the collapse of the Palestinian authority would be more dramatic than many people think, and that that could happen. I mean, that's a possibility. I mean, it's possible in the sense that if you had the Israel, if the if you had a government in Israel that was willing to, and a Palestinian uh, government uh, in both Gaza and the West Bank that were uh, willing to hammer out all the final status issues, and the Israelis willing to, Palestinians were willing to contemplate a temporary presence of Israelis in certain locations with a view to eventually leaving. Um, the, the general parameters, it, it could still be possible because they haven't completely cut off Jerusalem from, uh, they haven't built the E1 settlements. Um, Palestinian, there have been various proposals to uh, dismantle some settlements, to put some settlements in the Palestinian sovereignty to offer citizenship to uh, those who, want, who will be willing to live under the Palestinian authority, although there probably wouldn't be very many of them. Um, uh, so, it, it, I mean, like I said, 10 years ago, you had Annapolis where the two sides almost reach an agreement. Um, so it's not completely, but, but with the current, if you like, kaleidoscope, the current constellation of all the things that are happening in the region since 2011, and with the current, uh, you know, what's happened in the Gaza Strip, the current government in Israel, the weakness of the Palestinian Authority, the current US, uh, 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 you know, US government not showing any interest or showing interest for more extreme Israeli moves, and the Europe's, Europeans being very weak and divided. Um, the, I don't see it as being likely. And so what the Palestinians are doing is saying, this is the state of affairs that we find ourselves in. Uh, we have to do what we can in the, in the small arenas where we're able to, uh, if you like, assert our sovereignty, if you want to call it that. 
And so you've seen them go into international institutions, join members, uh, appeal before international courts, um, until they hope that eventually, after their steadfastness, the situation will one day change. They've been through rough times before. This is more rough times. They, they're there. They exist. They are not a small minority. They're a big community. And someone one day will have to recognize that and deal with them. I think that's what they're, they're thinking is. Do you think if any upcoming war might change the political scene in Israel? Sorry, Given upcoming, what? upcoming war? Uh, sorry, war. war. W A R. Yeah. Will change like this or set the stage for more uh, truthful negotiations with the Palestinians? Or? Um, a war between who? <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, you, we've had lots of wars. You've had small wars with, well, I mean, small's relative. You've had wars with southern Le uh, with Lebanon uh, in 2006. You've had three conflicts in the Gaza Strip. I remember people saying in 2009, Israel had gone too far. I think Norman Finkelstein, who's a scholar in America, had even written an article since this time he went too far. And, you know, you saw what happened in 2014. So... And people said, oh, there's going to be a dramatic change. You know, no one can defend Israel after what they did. We have Trump. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't think it, uh, unless it's a really dramatic war, like kind of like, I don't know, 1967, 1973 style, where you had, you know, armies and tanks and, uh, uh, you know, which is not going to happen. Uh, you're not going to see any radical change. The, the balance of power is heavily tilted in... Um, uh, weighted in Israel's favor as regards the countries uh, immediately around it. I mean, to the extent that in the Sinai Peninsula, the Israelis are helping the Egyptian government put down uh, uh, rebellions. Um, so, so uh, it, it's un in my view, it's unlikely. Yeah. The and, and helping the Saudis in Yemen. There you go. I didn't know that. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> politics and that I don't think the Israelis will have the political courage to really find a solution and whenever they try to do something or um, which comes closer to a solution they, they, they it's, it's just I mean the, the more conservative people in, in Israel will just go against it and I don't know especially with, with uh, BB's current election results, we don't know if there's going to be a third round. Um, don't know whether he's going to be indicted as well. Mm. Um, the only thing it ultimately boils down to, to the lack of the pol to political will in that. Yeah, no, I think that's a factor as well. There's some, I think what someone once said, it's much harder for a democracy or, you know, government was a, change, uh, a country that has a change of government to negotiate a peace treaty than with the Arab countries where it's usually the same, sometimes it's the same person. It goes on for years and years and years. I should say something. You triggered something, a thought. I mean, one of the things of the deal of the century or discuss, the wider discussions before that term was used, going back to the Obama administration and the work of Elliot Abrams, was this concept of bringing an Arab, kind of an Arab quartet, an Arab coalition that would be willing to recognize ex openly Israel. And so, uh, they never quite fleshed it out. Um, but of course, the idea is this would, from the Arab perspective, I imagine it would be a peace plan that was similar to the Arab Peace Initiative. And that would give even a right wing Israeli government you know, some leverage to say, well, look, you know, we withdraw from some territory, but look what we get in exchange. We get full normalization with most of the Arab world. Um, but I think Jerusalem uh, appeared to have, uh, to have killed that because by coming out and recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital and not even coming out, we still haven't heard anything what's in it for the Palestinians. It's made it very hard for those countries in the Gulf who, who would have probably favored uh, such a dynamic uh, from being able to carry it out because it, it laid open criticism from Turkey, Iran, and other countries to say, well, look, they're willing to give Israel Jerusalem and the holy places in exchange for what? What have they got in exchange? Nothing. So, so that, 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 there was a lot of talk a couple of years ago about this kind of... And maybe that, maybe that made sense, right, in some ways, but... Uh, maybe it's still ongoing, who knows, but, but I don't see it. And the Palestinians, of course, are opposed because they say it's, 
it's, it's Netanyahu's outside inside approach, um, which they are very suspicious of. Someone's got his hand up. Yeah. Hi. Writing on the earlier question, what do you think would be the policy difference if we see a Gantz government versus a Netanyahu government? A good question. Um, I mean, he hasn't, Gantz hasn't said that much uh, publicly about what, how he would differ, probably because if he sounded too dovish, he would lose uh, the election. Um, and, he, uh, and Palestinians complained bitterly that he had uh, one of his uh, campaigns showed you know, how tough he was in the Gaza Strip. You know. um, on the other hand, there are those who say that, uh, again, this is just anecdotal, say that he's far more moderate than Netanyahu, who's not ideologically wedded to the settlements, and that if he were in power, he would be different. At the same time, the Arab joint list has, well, most of the members of the joint list have said that they would be willing to enter into some kind of arrangement with, uh, if he had the numbers, his, uh, his party. Um, and if that were the case, although there's lots of people who say that he would never do that because it's just not acceptable in Israel to have a coalition with the Arab parties, um, but he could perhaps rely on them uh, as, as uh, Rabin did, you could perhaps then see, see some difference. Um, but we have yet, we haven't seen if whether he's even able to cobble up a coalition, and there's some suggestions that if Netanyahu stepped down, a more likely match would be Likud and uh, Kahol Levan, which then would probably be very little change uh, in that regard. Any more questions? Okay, well thank you very much for, for listening and for your, for your questions.